Fireside Chat on a beautiful, warm summer Sunday evening. My name is Mark, and I've got Brent here. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Welcome to our Fireside Chat. Been a very, very interesting week. It's a lovely, warm summer's evening. We had a few cold evenings, a few cold nights of, of late, but I still think a bit of that sharp, sharp sharpness in the morning. In the morning, which yeah. which is sort of the, the seasons changes upon us. But I think, when did you like, when when have you ever seen combretums and things turning yellow in March? I mean, it's, it's like True. one of these really early, early autumns that is totally unexpected. And I think that's mostly got to do with these cold temperatures that are coming yeah. up. And also, I mean, we've been, we've had quite a wet spell in this area for the last couple of years. So we've been dry, lucky. Yeah, dry spell's been on the cards. I don't know when we last had a drought. I, for me personally, the biggest was back in the early 80s, but I believe back in maybe 2007, I think it was, 6. It was a little bit dry, but still, we still got, I mean, I was down south then. Um, I was I was in the I was in the Cape. i come back from Kenya and I'd been in the Cape. So I also, I hadn't been here for a few years, between about 2001 and 2007. No, it was dry, but it wasn't... I don't know if it's going to be as... It wasn't as dry as I think it's going to be this year. Mm, I think this is a drought coming. Yeah. I don't think... There, well, there's certainly there hasn't been enough rain to fill up the dams that are going to last. No. I mean, the dams already are looking so low. I mean, we watched a buffalo today almost walk the whole way through Buffalsock Dam. Really? And, and he was not even up to his neck. He went through the middle part there, which was quite... But that's strange because we've seen elephant almost submerging. I always thought it was so much deeper because no, it's not with that spot where they were submerging, just yeah. off to the right. I think there's a there's a hollow there where the hippos and stuff sit in. But where that termite mound? Yeah, is, yeah, off there. But he crossed the other side. I mean, walked straight across that wide section. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see the buff cross Gary Dam. Yeah, it's yeah they, they walk across and they're not even sort of shoulder height, yeah. shoulder depth. It's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Well, I know it, it's a bit tough with animals, but it does make our job a little <laughs> bit easier when it's dry. Um, it track, does. Tracking's easier. The, you can see more on the grass. Um, yeah, so it does make our life a little bit easier. It does. Uh, but it's not only it's not only the tracking. It's the the, the dependence on on on, on what the water there is. Water is. Yeah. Because so many of the little pans and water holes and mud wallows that would still ordinarily be around at this time of the year, they've all dried up. I mean. Yeah. We found a really interesting one um, this evening yeah. while we were looking for, for Karula behind Buffalo Dam yeah. on, on, the, on the fire break there. As you drive across that eastern drainage that goes in, the eddies have excavated there, but it's still seeping. So okay. there's still water. There's a little seep there, a little perfect little little puddle there. Oh, there he is. One of the mantis. mantis. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Come back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is that sort of on that... that Western arm of no, on the east eastern arm yeah. of Buffalo Sock, but on the on the fire break, on the fire break, on the fire break. So between the uh, f well, fifty meters oh, from right, Buffalo's, I know where you're talking about Buffalo's now. cut line, yeah. Yes. And then, and I looked in there because I mean, uh, today was we, we we literally we were desperate for Karula being her birthday. <laughs> I know. It was, and and I, I, I so many people were trying to. I walked that block where she was last seen. I walked up both arms of the drainage line from the dam to the to the to the um, fire okay, break, yeah. and then I walked both edges of the drainage line, trying to see if maybe she was lying up on the edge, just looking for a track to start following. And then we heard Franklin alarming in, in Buffalo's Hook, so I stopped and I thought, "Jesus, these Franklin sound really, really upset." So I walk in there and I see a slender mongoose, <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, it's not her." Come back, but then they start going again, but the slender mongoose has gone away. So I go back and I climb the turtle mound, and there's still nothing. Um, but when a leopard doesn't want to be seen, no, a leopard yeah, doesn't want to be seen. But are we sure that it was Karula? Apparently. <laughs> because then there were reports of Karula being seen in... In, Kur in, Koro, in Koro. But that was yesterday morning. <clears throat> it, it's, it's kind of... It's a bit... Well, it's not, it's not out of the ordinary and no. it's not impossible. But it is a little bit far for her to have traveled. Because she was seen in Torchwood last night. Heading... That way. That's true. She was and, on the access road. And we found the tracks on Cheetah. Uh, we Cheetah found female che tracks on Cheetah Cut Line, and heading general direction was sort of northwest towards Buffalo Hook when she went into the block. The weirdest thing is that I found female tracks on Zoe's road, and although I couldn't find anything, um, I was with Scott. It was when Scott was with me on camera. It was the same morning. It was yesterday morning, I think. Friday morning. Fri no, it was yeah, Friday morning. Yeah. 
Um, it was when she was seen east of us. And I was wondering who that female, maybe that was Tundi that came in on uh, onto that, that end of the world. But I did a similar thing today with tree, Treehouse Dam, in and out of that drainage line. And I got there, every now and then, unfortunately, we get a little bit, not, it's not necessarily confused, but every now and then we just get stumped. That, that was me this afternoon, completely You, you get stumped. that last track. You, you, you can be on foot and you find that, that last footprint and you'll do a big loop, whether it's roads or game paths or patches of sand, where animal, wherever it may be, you might find a print, but sometimes it, it's just, there's nothing. And I mean, you can see well, from us following quarantine this morning, he went north, south, east, west yes. in the space of an hour. <laughs> so, I mean, he went this way, he went you, that way, he went this yeah. way. So, like... You could forget about predicting. Where exactly. Cats exactly. <laughs> so I mean, and that was a perfect example this morning. Yeah. But um, the lines have been quite interesting. Yeah. And while you've been gone, so the Nkahumas have lost members and refound members and lost members oh, right. and refound members, yeah. and now they've crossed into Manuleti. They have. Yeah, they crossed the last tracks. Um, Ephraim had yesterday. I mean, sorry. Yeah. No, this morning, he had tracks of them near Jordan's. Where they were last seen um, at Kaimanzi or Big Dam, that side. Yeah. And they went right up to the Manuleti boundary and north. That's interesting because they're going to invariably encounter some cats up there that are not going to... Not going to enjoy. enjoy. And, and, and that area has got a high density of lions. It has. Um, it's, it's funny. There's a high density of lions and a low density of, of vehicle pressure. It is very low density of vehicle pressure there. I think there's only two lodges up there. Yeah, well, there's Pungu and then oh, 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 Three. And Honey Guy. Honey guy, I don't think honey guy would come down this far. I do. But um, I don't know. I, 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 when I, I did a stint at honey guy, although I think the honey oh. guy that I was at, I just heard it. Yeah, no, no, it was an Ellie. Uh, I'm a I've only got one ear, so I'm not. Well, we got all the impalas have now decided it's safe to sit around us. Well, no, they, no kidding. There's literally we're surrounded by <coughs> impalas, but there sounds like there's an Ellie down here somewhere. I just heard an ear head shake. Yeah, we'll just I keep it. My right ear is the only ear that can hear, yeah. and I think my left ear, because this ear is deaf to certain frequencies from yes, I know, I've <laughs> the army. And this ear hears everything, and this time I've got, and I normally have this earpiece here. So it, right now I'm speaking, and it sounds like it's coming from inside my head because <laughs> I can't. Let's change the subject. Yeah. But so, oh, back to the lions. Yes. So, and then I, I spoke to, to the, the head guide from Sibambidi today. Yeah. And there's um, sticks were heading this way from that side. So that might have been why I found a track. But yeah. And then there were some other lions that they're not sure who they are down Cheetah Plant. Okay. So, there's other lions around. Um, so did they give you a composition of the, the lions? Just two females. Two females. The sticks is two females and four or five sub-adults or like about a year old or I've only seen well when they've been here since I've been back they've only been the two females uh, I'm, this is just what I was being told yeah. by the guys at, at a, Touch Rugby an adult today. and a younger female okay but I, we, we've seen them I think maybe what two or three times welcome to well, since I've been back two or three times if we're lucky that they've been back here but I think mm. Peter and Hayden might have seen them a few more times before I got back okay um, Sticks used to be here all the time and Sticks have oh. been right here and uh, the funniest thing is that uh, the Sticks Pride I know from 2006-2007 from, from was nine, nine, nine or ten adult lionesses, like eight cubs. And apparently the, the Majinga lions yeah. took, took them apart, killed, killed most of them. Yes, I think we, Alex in fact was with me when Alex was here and Seb. And there was one time when we had two vehicles running. Um, the, we had the, the one vehicle that had, I think it was, we, it was Gunda, if I'm not mistaken, that had this 3D rig on it. And I think Seb and somebody else was, uh, it might have been Alex, that was on Jigger. This is Jigger, by the way. Pardon? What's that, Alex? But anyways, there were four of us. Uh, and Herman, yes, maybe Herman was with me too. But we had the Majingi lines eating a lioness off of Twin Dams Road. Uh, and that, that little track. Was that a six? Was that a six lioness? Oh, okay. Um, that that was probably towards the end of the the Majingi lines destruction of other prides. It's quite strange because the the lions that came in before them, the Mapohos, did the same thing. Yes. I mean, I watched them. I watched the one kill, mate with the corpse, and then eat the lioness. Well, that's bizarre. No, it is. It's, it, that's why he got the nickname Satan. 
Okay, well that's bizarre. But that just goes to show that animal behavior is nothing that you can nothing yeah. you can predict. That, that there, you can never say what is going to happen when a male foreign male takes over a territory. We all believe, and we all are, are, are led to believe to a certain extent that the males will come in and they'll take over a pride and they'll kill cubs up to a year. And it's almost like we're reciting it all from a single observation from a single book. And when have you ever seen that? I uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> it's different every yeah. time it happens. And and depends on the area. Yeah, as exactly. Well. Depends on the line pressure. Oh, what you got? Oh, uh, oh, looks like a clip. Just by the way, our, our bench is covered in termites. termites yes, so oh, if no. we start jumping, it means we've got ter literally we've got ants in our pants. Because yes. it's ants and termites. Well, the termites are trying to retreat, retreat and it's the ants that are trying to catch them. And I mm. think the ants might find us somewhat competitive for their termites. Mm. But anyways, it's, it's interesting how the lion dynamics have changed, but also interesting that you've experienced some of the same lions from further south yeah. um, to the lions that we've been experiencing here. And it's, it's sort of, it's wonderful that we've now got this continuation of, of, of not only knowledge, but history of knowing where cats have come from and experiencing them from another part of the south. Um, Sticks Styx was one of the biggest prides in, in the sands of the stage. Yeah, sticks was I think the groomers were, were were always bigger. They were since I've been here bigger than the sticks. Um, I'm gonna have to ask for help from viewers uh, what the composition of the sticks was when I arrived because I, I guess it just all merges with all the pride, Guys, especially and, those up and, at home. And you and see so many lines. I know it, it sounds. It sounds it, I know it sounds like, terrible, guys, like, but yeah, we're talking about them like Impala, but yeah. it, it's not that way at all. Because then there's lines, I see lines in Thornybush, then I see lines in Tumvati, then I see lines where my parents live, and then we see lines here, and then... <laughs> East Africa. East Africa, Botswana, and just, yeah. There's another subject that we both mentioned today, Gabon. Gabon, yes! First lion seen in... 20 years. 20 years, so the last lion officially shot in Gabon was in 1997, um, in the southern Bateke province. Um, and I actually had a re When I first went up to Gabon, we had big conversations, I was like... There have to be lions there because there are lions in the Congo. So there's a big section of savanna that comes into southern, into the rainforest there. And and there were historically lions there. Um, but with poaching pressure and human pressure, they disappeared. And they have these remnant populations in Congo. And it is a young dispersal male. Um, I've seen the photograph. He looks he looks probably about three years old. Which is might not be... What's your... Yes? Yeah, I'm watching. Yeah. <laughs> uh, might not be the best thing because I don't know if he's going to find any girls in that area but you never know the last um, there's an organization called Panthera who, who studies and monitors cats all over the world I've seen there's a vehicle of theirs in Hoodsbury yeah no they do they've got a leopard they've got a leopard project ongoing in, in this part of the world um, and uh, the the head of their program in in for the rainforest in, in Gabon he spent six months looking for lions down there because he got told by locals there were lions. He went there and they took him to the tracks and there were hyena. Oh. Spotted hyena. And I don't think, because people haven't seen the lions for so long, they get... Get excited. Get very excited, it, yeah. yeah. And they found a hyena, actually active hyena spot, uh, spotted hyena den. Right. And then about seven months later, in the middle of a window, which is far away from any savannah or whatnot, the first record of a spotted hyena in the middle of a rainforest. Wow. Spotted. But I think... Having seen camera uh, camera traps coming out of uh, not only Gabon but but all over sort of that area of West Africa, that there are all sorts of things that are yeah. coming up on camera that well, this is not supposed to be here. <laughs> Where did it come from? The what? They just appear. They're not oh. supposed to be there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so animals that have become so secretive because of the human pressure and because of the the, the population pressures of or, or, or deforestation. The, the, the limiting of their habitat have become so secretive and so sensitive perhaps to humans and I suppose the wave of destruction that we bring along with us that they become so secretive that it's only with the advent of camera traps and things that we are able to actually photograph yeah, and get, and, get and the terrain up there is just beyond like just being able to move through it is nearly impossible well, this is, I, I, we all dream of every naturalist. Every we all dream of going into rainforest and into. But you've told me how it's not so much fun. <laughs> it's thick and it's hot and everything bites you. Yeah, um, for noon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but we're well, just moving back on. We have been having a, an incredible streak at the moment. I know. Today is to things, yeah. fourteen days. 
couch where we've had cats every day. No, we we did this last last week, and I was like, oh, we might be in trouble. Oh, that's a big click beetle. Get away from the fire. A big one. Uh huh. There's a dead one I Bop. wanted to bring on drive Bop. today. I love them. They're one of my favourite oh, horses. That's a big male. Yeah. Okay. Insects normally go on the hat. Okay. <laughs> um. Let's say, yeah, 14 days in a row we've had cats. There's only, I think, two drives in that 14 days we haven't. Right. And we, one was a last minute on Cheetah Cut Line, <laughs> 10 minutes before the end of drive. Okay. <laughs> we, sort of reprieve the last In the minute. evening, the incumbents, this is thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it's been, it's been really good. And then obviously lots of ellies, great ellies around. It is the time of the year. I, I think uh, historically, if I remember correctly, this time, of, although the dams are normally a lot fuller, at this time of the year going into April is when a lot of the family units that use this area, after the bulls have all been here because of the marulas in January and February, that these family groups tend to come in and they they ut- quite extensively utilize the area. They, 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 they use the round leaf teak quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, elephant candy. Elephant candy, yeah. It look like lollipops, they strip it up. <laughs> and the reverse. Mm. Yeah. But it's been, a, I can't believe it. Uh, especially being away and you guys, I, I'd get the odd update from friends who were on Facebook, you know, even though when I was at home I didn't have it, or I was at uh, the Bush Pub and Inn where I was staying and Wi-Fi there, just catching up with what you guys are doing, and I couldn't believe it. And dogs. Yeah. There was one. Dogs, there was one good dog size. Um, but just the, the cats that you've been, and the fact that the cats have been here, because so much, or so many times in the past, Especially like the Kahumas or, or one of the lip, they'd come onto to Juma or Gauri, they'd come onto the property for maybe a day yeah. and they were off again the next evening unless it was a case of the Matimbas or some of the male killing a buffalo and having enough time here to finish eating buffalo. Uh, the, the, lions, the lions have been sort of like that on and off, on mm. and off. And, and the Kahumas have been struggling a little bit, they've been hungry for a long time and they were literally marching these huge distances. They would, we would see them cross at Sydney's Dam. Yeah. Then they would pop up bottom side of Torchwood. Wow. And then they would pop up <coughs> coming in across Cheetah Cut Line in ice in like the space of 48 hours. No, that's for that. So they've been, we're wondering whether the Birminghams were pushing them or whatnot. But I, f- I got the update from the guys up in Manueti. The Birminghams are sitting at Tinswale. They're miles away. But that's interesting then. What, what would be pushing Lion to cover so much? Unless there's a threat of... of because that's what we thought. But the other males around that are making yeah. them move so much big distances. Very interesting. But having said that, you know, we went through so many weeks, in fact, I can't even remember, we've been counting how many weeks, how many days we've had cats, but I don't know if we really counted how many weeks and how many days we didn't have any <laughs> cats, or that there wasn't a single leopard track. There, no. uh, there were, we couldn't find a sign of a leopard on the property for a couple of weeks. And now, luckily, I suppose most of the last two weeks, the last 14 days, have been leopard, actually. Yes. And we, we've... Um, all sort of four of the regulars. Uh, Mvula, uh, quarantine, this is the first time for me, but I think Scott had him around Treehouse uh, a while he ago. He seems to be spending more time south. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, uh, Karula a couple of times. Um, Scott had some great sighting of her on the Stenbock Kill, up on um, I saw photos Rebecca's Philemon's Fulham, Yeah. And then, and then we had um, Kunyuma. For nearly three, three, nearly four days. That bushbuck and the bushbuck kill. That was just before I got back. Yeah, that was that was spectacular. He had such a playful leopard. Yeah. Even though the snarl. I don't think I that just, snarl is aggressive. It's, a, it's when just I look almost. At that snarl, sometimes the ears go back, and sometimes he is a little bit aggro. But sometimes that snarl is just a. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, and then I, I, Brian and I found him in a cave, like one of these undercut caves, in the, in the riverbed. He was right behind the roots in there. And we were looking for him, looking for him, walking. And I went walking, and, and then suddenly yeah. he sits there and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> out of the cave. We're like, oh, there's a leopard next to us. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think it was the same thing today on the damn wall. Oh, like, was like, where, where, there's monkeys are me. Oh, leopard next to us. <laughs> uh, I was behind you, and I was watching because I'd seen the leopard. Both Andrew and I had seen the leopard. And I think you were concentrating on us behind you, or you. Were I was looking where the monkey. I was trying to see where the monkeys and were looking. And you were talking to me on the radio about where you were going to go. I think. Yeah. And we could see you react, and it's like there was the. Yeah, but right next to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think we should try to get some questions in. If 
there are. Yeah. If there are, yeah. That's a good idea. Otherwise, if we, anything... we, cause we can keep waffling all night. Yeah, we could. <laughs> okay, so... Um... <clears throat> Just again, Michigan. <laughs> oh, the strangest or weirdest thing from Jessica that you've seen, either here at Juma or... Well, I'll, let, I'll let you go to take this one first. It's so hard to, to, to find, so to think of something off the top of my head, because I, I, I will, once again, I can talk forever, be, well, I can think forever about what it is. The top of my head is hard, because nature is just that. Every single day, there are strange and wonderful things that happen. Every single day, you, what I call the gem, the gem of the day, and it could be a feather, or it could be a really strange sighting of an insect, or it could be something doing something I've never seen before. But it's like a sunset. You can have a most magnificent sunset and think it's the most beautiful sunset and then there's going to be another one and you just can't choose between the two which one is better. So experiencing nature, because nature is so phenomenal, it's kind of hard to say so. But as that question came through, I suppose one of the most intriguing things, one of the things that will stick with me for a long time, I might have mentioned it before, the Rafiji River flooded. And I, I'm, Brent has been to the Salu, so we, we, we've got common ground in, in a number of places, the same as with Scott, because Scott's also been to places in East Africa that we've been to. I think it's what makes us sort of click in a way that we understand certain things about places because we've all been to them. But the Rafiji came down in flood. It was 98, it was El Nino, and the, 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 the lakes burst. In fact, the Rafiji changed its course completely. It, it, it flowed stronger up towards Nsela Kela, whereas before it was sort of flowing straight into where old Impala camp was. So it changed things, and when the water subsided, eventually after the flood line had subsided and things were sort of getting back to normal, there was a colony of banded mongoose that must have been stranded in the reeds on the opposite side of the camp, where the entrance to the one lake is. And now the, the, the river did a big 90 degree bend, and at that bend was the entrance to a very large lake, but it was a re rather narrow entrance. It was only probably about 50 yards wide with a little narrow island in the middle. And then it broadened out into this big lake called Nzelakela. And right at that point where that entrance to the lake was, was the strongest flow you could find. I mean, there was tiger fish. There were, there were, it was, it Good was tiger the strongest. Fish. I've caught some big tiger fish yeah. in the refugee. Uh, it was very, very strong flow, but as, as soon as you went into the entrance to the lake, it was still water. And the crocodile used to hang around right there in front of the camp because fish would either be going upstream or downstream, and they'd hit that still water, and that's when the crocs would catch them. And this band of banded mongoose um, found themselves on the opposite side, which was just reeds. It was reeds for probably couple of hundred acres of reeds all the way up towards Beo Beo or to the other side of not quite Lake Manzi even but um, it was quite an expansive area of reed and they must have somehow this colony found themselves there and they got to the edge of the still water just off of the flow of the river and the only way for them to get out was to cross the river to where the trees were because they probably hadn't seen trees for gosh knows how long and they decided to cross. There were eight of them to begin with. And five of them went into the water. Three of them stayed behind. And within seconds, the crocs caught all five of those mongoose. And I know it's not the kind of thing that one wants to remember when a question like that is asked. But it is. It was a strange... It's a very it was, strange. No. It, was, it wasn't expected. It was... Uh, we, were sit, we, we hadn't been out on drive. hadn't gone out. I, think, I can't even remember. It could have been an afternoon or it could have been during lunch. So we were sitting out, always outside in a tented camp, and we saw them coming. We could hear them, the distress calls, because they, they, they finally broke through of the reeds. It was almost as though they hadn't seen land other than the reeds for days on end because it was such a vast area of reeds. And suddenly, across this little channel, and it was quite a deep channel, it was, I suppose, salvation for them. And it was like cheering on swimmers in an Olympic race almost because as soon as the first one entered the water the croc started moving in and <laughs> we just hoped one of them reached the island and the crocodile actually lunged out of the water and grabbed it off of the island and one develops a little bit of a rapport with mongoose I think I think I had, can... I had I had pet-blinded mongoose so oh yeah so yeah, you understand I, yeah I do <laughs> 
and Brian and Andrew both filmed the the the, the, the surrogates, the the, the meerkats. Yeah. <laughs> I oh. couldn't think of the name. Um, in in Botswana, you you do you develop a rapport with these little things, and and although I might not have known that little colony, it was still so sad that five of them and the other three refused to cross so they were stuck in the reeds and I don't know what happened to them I don't know if that's what the question was about but that's the first thing that came to mind when I was asked oh, it's, it's a difficult one actually mentioning a crocodile is one of the strangest things I've seen is a, the only thing I've ever seen kill a honey badger really? a crocodile and the only thing I've seen a crocodile not eat <laughs> I think he bit, bit really? it and it just got a full spray from it and, oh, the, the, gland, and yeah. the croc just left the honey badger right there and nothing else ate it, not hyenas, not anything. Um, but I think the strangest sight, it's actually probably one of my favorite sightings of all time, also very funny, um, was lions in Pangolin um, in northern Botswana. Um, we were with a pride of lions up, up on the Kwando River. Yeah. And it was sort of, we got there around 4.30, quarter, quarter to 5. We knew where they were from the morning, waiting for them to go hunt. And um, there was a male, probably about 18 months old. And about four lionesses, and the lionesses and and the, and, the, and the other cubs were much younger. And, sorry, not a pangolin, a honey badger again. Oh, I got confused yeah. okay. again. Yeah. And um, the lioness and the other, others were lying there, and this honey badger did the proper honey badger and sort of march past, looks at the lions like marches on, and the young male decides no, he's going to have a go, and gets just this dust like October in northern Botswana. He, Dust yes, everywhere. The powder, and, uh, the talcum powder. Yeah, and it ends up with the lion with his paw like this, yeah. and the honey badger flat like this in the sand. And and every time the, the young male lion lifted his paw, the honey badger mow, 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 and push it down again. <laughs> and then the lionesses got up and they started stretching and they started walking. And you could see him going, "Now what do I do?" <laughs> you know, I let it go. Oh, you let me. Exactly. So he kept and he looked at the lionesses and he looked at the honey badger and he'd lift his paw slightly. And, mow, and he'd push him down again. And you could almost see this lion counting in his head. He's like, okay, one, two, three. And he pushed this honey badger literally almost under the sand. Yeah. Like so hard and, and jumped as high as he could in the opposite direction. Honey badger turns on, chased him for a good 200 meters, yeah. but could never catch him, not fast enough. So, mow, 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 and like complaining, making so much noise um, until the lion got far enough away and the honey badger left him. That was one of the strangest, funniest sightings I've ever had. Before you mentioned it was a honey badger when you still... A pangolin, no, yeah. I, I was thinking, but of, I, I was I trying to think of, of a, weird sightings. Yeah, I was thought of, it, it, what came to mind was a very similar situation in Sabi Sabi, way back when. Um, lion had been on a giraffe kill and they would walk almost a kilometer to the, lo to the nearest dam for water and then go back to the giraffe kill because they were on this giraffe kill for like four or five days. And there was one evening that a honey badger came trotting across the road just in front of a young lioness. She'd left because the two females were still on the kill. And she'd left the females. It was a, She was probably about two, two and a half or so. And I, I think she was lucky. But she walked towards this water. She, and I decided to leave the kill and follow her. And ahead on the road, a honey badger had crossed the road. And she must have seen the movement out of the corner of her eye. And when she got to where it crossed the road, she turned to follow it, but the honey badger had actually stopped and turned around. The honey badger didn't even have to do anything. She saw it was a honey badger, and she thought, oh, I think I'll go and have some water. Yeah, just ignore, <laughs> ignore it. Ignore yeah. it. And I, I, but I've, I've heard stories. I haven't, sadly, I haven't seen it often enough of interactions between lion and honey badger. I think that's probably the only one that I can think of. We used to see it quite frequently in northern Botswana towards the end of the dry season. Yeah. There literally wasn't a braid of grass Ooh, for... Sorry. Oops, for three, four kilometers around the river, yeah. so you could see uh, Everything. for miles at night, yeah. especially with spotlights. Yeah. Thanks for that question. That was a that, that was, was a fun one. Yeah, I mean, there's always no. We once one thing, once you get to think about, start it. thinking. Uh, I thought of a few more, but we'll have to, I have to save them for next time. Just make sure we're not being stalked. Seven lionesses and nine cubs in 2009 for the sticks. Year and a half. Three lionesses and two sub ales after a year and a half. Yeah. Deborah, thank you for that information. Thanks, that Deborah. It just shows how that pride within a year and a half was, was taken out. Decimated. Yeah. But it, 
I think one of the strangest things about that is that the more we've had coalitions coming into the Sabi sand, the, 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 the less lion have bred because of the fact that every time a coalition comes in, they're not only killing cubs, but they're killing or males, adults. they're killing adult females mm. as well. See, my experience with Sabi sands has always been coalitions. Yeah, you see, down in the south in the 80s, early 90s, the, the biggest was two. Yeah. I mean, when I started I started down there, I think there was a, there was a coalition of four shores miles. Okay. Yeah, so that, there's always been big coalitions since I've been in the sand. Um, but I, I don't know if the, as far as I know, because I, 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 I've got the lion stats and stuff, the lion population of a whole of the sand hasn't, hasn't gone hasn't down. It hasn't changed. Mm -mm. It stayed pretty, pretty stable. If anything, I think in the last couple of years, it's actually increased a bit. Even with uh, TB and all the other, other things. But, well, I, I guess in general and as a whole that might be the case, but I think certainly up here in this part of the world, because we used to have prides here, that ha we haven't seen proper cub, well, personally. I mean, we had this three-year break, and obviously there have been cubs that have survived because we've got these youngsters now that are two and a half, three years old. So I, I, I'm not saying that they haven't been, but I, I think under... Oh, shame. I think it was a mantis phone. Oh saved itself <laughs> didn't go into the fire um, the, 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 the constant changing of large coalitions of males here in the northern Sabi sand has to a large extent prevented females from having cubs but, um, I mean, or, or successfully raising cubs and I, I, I'd love to hear from people like Sil in Canada or, or any of the other people who are, are closely watching the lion populations but also to a degree, having those large coalitions. So, I mean, if you look at the, the Mapopo, for instance, they, once they stopped their nonsense, uh, when they were young, killing females and doing strange things like that, they sort of, they stabilized that whole area for a, a, a relatively long time. They did, I suppose. So, I mean, having those big coalitions, although there's that initial sort of, Mayhem. Decimation. They, they, they're stabilized, and having four or five individuals, they're going to be able to, they're not going to be on the top for two or three years, no. say, if you're one, one male. In uh, the Mopoho, they last longer. Mopoho were there five, years. six years. I mean, that's really long for, and that, I think, is purely just the size of the coalition. There's no one who can no, really, much so. really fight with them. No, very much so. But it's very interesting. Mark's playing with his click beetle. Jeffrey from Texas, I think if I got that correctly. Hi, Jeffrey. Nice to hear from you this evening. Good Glad evening. you're watching our, our fireside chat. Um, Wanting to know. <laughs> it's a click beetle clicking. Uh, if it if it's on my hat, it's going to chew my hat. Yeah, it can yeah. chew into the wood. I've actually got a dead click beetle. I can show you in our next drive when I'm showing beetles again. I've got a whole lineup for the next week. Um, Jeffrey, um, is it only leopards that show an interest and come up to the vehicles? I think that was the question. I think that's referring to um, what happened this morning. Do leopards go out of yeah. their way? So what happened this morning is we, we had those tracks and then uh, quarantine came in afterwards. I saw his tracks afterwards. He came out and she's a cut line later. I saw oh, them on this top of your track? I, this, I saw them this evening when oh, I was okay. there. So we were following... And then we were going down Drakensberg, and then we heard kudu and monkeys behind us. So we turned around and we went back. Yeah. And then by the time we got back there, it was all quiet. So we knew there was something, something there. Yeah. So we drove around, drove around, three times around that little block between um, Mamba, Drakensberg, and Chilakatan. I was like, it has to be here, it has to be here. And I saw the kudu, where the kudu were, and they, they were, they'd been barking, so I was like, it has to be around here. So eventually... This one sort of um, section, there were cesticulars alarming every single time we drove past. So I said, well, it's a bit of a long shot. I'm going to jump out of the car, and maybe if he's around, he might pop his, head, pop his head. So I walked off, and I walked, and I checked around all the thickets, and it was relatively open there. And I said, okay, well, jeez, these brimming leopards today are giving me a hard time again. So I took a buffalo thorn to explain the whole spirit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I took the buffalo thorn and I still wanted to listen. So I said, listen guys, I'm just going to stand out of the vehicle and speak and not put the, the, the earpiece in so I can listen if something starts alarm calling again because I find it very difficult to... You can't hear with one. Yeah. So, and also to pinpoint 
direction with one ear. So, you know, so I said, okay, I'm just going to listen, and I'm gonna, I'll tell you the whole story about the buffalo thorn while I'm listening. And I'm quite convinced quarantine came to have a look what I was doing. Because he came from somewhere else, and then all of a sudden, as I got back in the car, he's sitting in front of us. <laughs> like, literally coming to the car, just obviously saw mo- m- movement or something away, and he came to have a look. I think, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, I think I've, I can think of a, a few incidents when just our presence has brought a leopard out. Yeah. When, when we used to have a leopard down, you might have heard of it, actually, uh, a leopard called Quilamtini. What was her name? It's something to do with climbing up trees. Um, she was a young female um, between Inyati, Ulusaba, Delini, along the Sand River. And when she heard a vehicle, she would climb a marula tree and she'd lie down and she'd prima donna, <laughs> she'd, she'd display. Um, or if she was in the reeds in the Sand River, when she heard a vehicle, she'd come out and lie in the sand, and 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 it was almost the sort of here I am, I'm on show type of thing. That was curiosity, just just to have a look. So. But the thing is that she took it a little bit further. Yeah. She started climbing up onto the floorboards, and oh, then naughty, yeah. eventually she once reached up and touched one of the guides, and then Oof, she also reached that's up a bit and scary. tapped one of the guests, and then we had to discourage her. So oh, we had to bang the car when her, she came too close. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what happened. Um, Quela Pezulu, maybe. Quella, I remember a Quella female in the West. Quella was one of her daughters, I think. Okay. Um, I'm talking 1996 now when she yeah, was say. having her first, well, she was she was the age of these boys now. She was about two, two and a half, I think, when she started doing that. And then, no, she, then she had a cub with uh, a big male at the time. She had a young male cub. The big male at the time was Mbombi. I know. Mbombi. Mbombi. He, he was born at Londo's. He was born at Londo's. He was 11 years. So he was born in the mid-90s, about 95. Oh, yeah, yeah, he would have been dead before I arrived. <laughs> <laughs> long, no. long dead. No, because he was 11 in... Uh, sorry, 85. So he was 11 in 96. No, I started in the Sands in 2002, okay. three. Yeah, He was long dead. <laughs> so it was maybe his son. <laughs> yeah. I forget. I'm a little bit older than <laughs> I think maybe just curiosity. I think it depends on the animal. So certain animals, just in with a different personality, might be a little bit more curious, and others not so much. It is one of those things. It's, it's some leopards do, and some leopards don't. I mean, you get you, you look at look at the, the the characters, the characteristic, or the or the or the temperament and the and, and the personalities of the two brothers, Quarantine and Kanuma, and perfect, the perfect example, example yeah. of where some do and some don't. Anyway, Sherry was asking a question of penguins common in Africa. And they <laughs> are in one tiny right. little place. Right. Yeah. A rare sight. Is it a rare sighting? It is everywhere in Africa except for a couple of tiny little spots on the coast down in the Cape where the only colonies exist. I'm quite, I'm quite sad they changed the name of the penguin. So they did? When I, when I started bird watching and whatnot, um, I always wanted to see penguin and I used it loved its name um, but it's now called an African penguin uh, instead of uh, a, it used to be called the jackass penguin, jackass penguin because it's it sounds very much like a, a donkey braying so it used to be called the jackass yeah. penguin but they've now changed it to an African penguin yeah, but can you imagine what would happen if they called it the donkey penguin yeah it kind of doesn't make <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense <laughs> but yes it's it's I think it's very very closely related to that a penguin that lives in the sort of Southern tip of Australia, I think there are also penguins there. Marconi or Rock Hopper, one of the two. Yeah. But it is rather unusual because they are Southern Hemisphere penguins. Well, they, they not Southern Hemisphere. They're, they're the only African penguins. Only African penguins. Um, so far north of uh, of the Arctic. Uh, occasionally we get vagrant rock hoppers, or, but there, there's always been debate whether someone's picked them up on a ship and then dumped, dumped them, them on the shore. But... But they do cover a lot of ground. Yeah. We've had some very interesting data coming in, in fact, with the penguins, because although the colonies only exist in a couple of places in so- on the southern coast, they kind of migrate between them, I think. Yeah. And it, was, it, it, it took an oil spill, of all things, to be able to put satellite tracking devices on penguins. And what happened was that they actually managed to read habilitates these penguins. We've got a, a, an organization called Sandcob, 
and sand carp do very good work. Um, what does it stand for? Oh, South African National. Um, yes, they deal with oil spills and seabirds and. I'm sorry, sand carp. We the, can't remember the, your the acronym. It's just too we long. We live here in the bush. The sea's far away. <laughs> There's no excuse. It's a conservational S A N C O B. And sand carp is primary, primarily responsible for for rescuing and, and, and rehabilitating seabirds and sea life. Any, sea any lions, sort of, seals. Any like marine that, life yeah. that is affected by... They do phenomenal work. And it was after a particularly bad oil spill down in the Cape that they actually managed to put two tracking devices on, on two penguins. And it was quite incredible to have the country, in fact, involved in tracking them as they got back into their... South African Foundation for the conservation of coastal birds. There we go. Uh, South, National South Africa. One turned up National in... National Foundation. One turned up in Gabon. <laughs> really? Yeah. One, uh, of the, one of the colonies? One of, no, no, no. Just a uh, random, ran, random, uh, random African penguin turned up on the border of Congo and Gabon. Yeah, but then again, that could have been a ship. Uh, it could have, but it's quite difficult. I don't know. It's really interesting. They just found really? one. They found one alive on the beach in off the equator. Wow, that's interesting. Speaking of it, there's probably one of the only places in the world where you're going to have elephants on the beach and humpback whales. Yeah, and lots of whales. Yeah. You hear something? Yeah, I just heard something. Sounds like something walking. Okay, you listen to that, and I'll listen to this. Okay. It just <laughs> sounded like something was walking down here. I think it was a hyena trying to stalk Andrew because they know he's dead. Well, that's another thing we've been so lucky with the hyenas recently. Well, I, I don't know. It sounds like Alex is telling me that we're sort of running out of time here. And we've oh, only sure. had a few. But Eileen in Boston is asking a question, a very interesting question, and it's hard to really answer it because I'll start it with the depends, and that's another thing I want to find out. The, the other thing is is that there was a bingo today, and I want to know what the bingo was. We can find but, out. <laughs> yeah. But Eileen was asking, what is the best age to start children on safari? Now, a very good question. I, I, for me, it was I, I was probably conceived in the bush. I, I, since I was in diapers, I've been. Yeah. Um, but then look how I turned out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think another part of Eileen's question was with regards to children. Look, there's one thing about youngsters in the bush, and, not, and you can't really help it, is that it's very, very difficult for youngsters to keep still and keep quiet, especially on an open vehicle out in the bush. And I've had some hairy experiences with youngsters making a noise or even having babies on the vehicle in lion very sightings. Scary. And I've had to really get out of there fast because lion get very interested in baby crying it's because the same it sounds, as a distress call. It's a distress call. Um, well, Steenbuck, <laughs> very similar. Even a scrub hair now can sound like a baby. Um, and it's a distress call, and it's something that that just oh they hone in on it triggers so quickly. completely. But there's responsible parenting and there's irresponsible parenting, and I think that there is a place. I think it would. I think it's. It's crucial. I think it would be wonderful if everybody could expose their children to nature from a young age so that children could grow up with an appreciation and an understanding of it. Every child from a very young age should be exposed to it, should be able to feel the grass beneath, take their shoes off and walk barefoot on the grass and, and feel what nature and what life is. But within reason where it would be, I, I, I think... I was, I was. We were sitting up, setting up here this evening, and with the lights on, we can't really see what's behind the lights. We're not gifted with night vision, so for us having no tapetum, no, no night vision, the lights in our eyes make a, a wall of darkness around us. And actually, there was a hyena here just before you guys arrived. Andrew was setting up the lights, and he saw it. I didn't even see it. I was making the fire. For all I know, I'm back to the bush making the fire. I'm not saying that hyena would have done something. No. But animals do recognize young oh, of every species. And they recognize the difference between male and female. Uh, predators do this. And I've had times at home where I've left the fire and I've left only ladies sitting at the fire. 
and the hyena is bold and they'll stand up and shout and clap and the hyena stands and looks at them. But as soon as I come out of my house, the hyena looks at me and it doesn't run, it just it, it walks away because it but baboon I've got oh, baboon stories. and monkeys can tell the difference between a man and a woman instantly. And you know what? You get a you put a koi on and you pretend it doesn't work. No. <laughs> I know. I, to I, my, one of my first jobs working for my dad was chasing baboons for <laughs> three months for a pittance of a salary. <laughs> but um, but back to your dad. Yeah, <laughs> back back to back to your question there. Um, there are very specialised tailored safaris designed for kids these days. Um, the Pre- difficult thing is you can't have kids on a vehicle with other guests, so you need to have a private vehicle. Um, the reason for that is with children and not being able to stay quiet right. and whatnot for the drive you can't really have other people it affects their experience so there are especially tailored safaris that, that stick st- specifically to two kids where you you all on the same vehicle and then um when i've done safaris like that because family safaris are definitely a, a trend that is that is becoming far of uh far more than it was say five six years ago um you you just need to find the right program so like when i've done them i've got junior rangers courses we go make plaster paris tracks of lion tracks and whatnot. Clay animals. Clay animals. So if you, if, and it also depends on the lodge or, or area you want to go to. It is possible, but you do need to do a little bit of research into it, which would be the best fit depending on the age of the children. Yeah. There's some lodges that have very special sort of Family activities type, yeah, for kids. Exactly. And they, and, and they can take care of them. But also, I think it also would be better in, in, in some cases to be in predator-free environments at first so that kids can learn how to behave properly. No, you see, I think, in my experience, just as long as you pretty firm in the beginning, the, the do's and don'ts, but as you say, children are always unpredictable, which does make them difficult. The, the hardest thing that I've found with children in the bush, and there are a couple of kind of strong rules at night, don't run anywhere. Yeah. And I know it's hypocritical for me to say this, but don't let kids walk around barefoot at night. He says, sitting barefoot at night around a fire. But, yeah, but see, if you running get stung, around, you know making a noise, and especially the, the, the certain noises. Laughter. But how do you tell a child not to do that? Laughter. How do Laughter, you, excitement. <clears throat> the same will attract predators like this. Uh, how, do you, how do you stop you, children from being children? You just you need to keep them entertained with something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is easier said than done. But as I said, yeah, it just depends. You need you need you they need are, to research it a bit. You do, but I think it also it depends on how you've raised your children. I think to a large extent some people have raised the children to understand the need for quiet and the need for stillness. And I think it's not all kids that are going to run, that, that will run around. Like you that. know, there are, I, I know kids and, and kids who've grown up in the bush, I suppose, mostly they understand from a very young age because they're in it every day, but kids that visit the bush that have done so. There's like always, from there, a very there's young always age. the one way you can just scare the absolute living daylights out of them yes. before you start. If you go anywhere, they will, you will be eaten. <laughs> and yeah. they're bad. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I'd love to. I, I, I'm going to ask my mom. And my dad, actually, I'm going to ask them how it was that when we were young, although we were, it was mostly in camps in Kruger that had fences, but when we got to go home to the Timbavati when I was still quite young, I don't know, I think we just had an understanding that you, you, you behave, you've got, not, it's, not a, it's not a fear of anything happening as much as it is an understanding that you need to appreciate it, and I think maybe that's, that's the difference between the carrot and the stick. Uh, the stick approaches something's going to eat you, and it's 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 negative as opposed to the carrot side of things. Is if you're quiet, you're going to hear some wonderful things, and the more qu- you know, the, the sit still, things will happen, and and learning how to. But everybody's different. As much mm. as we sort of profess how how different animal behaviour is, gosh, they won't even start on you. Yeah, exactly. I, I find the animal behaviour a lot easier to predict than human. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. I think I've said something similar in the past. Very much so. Mm, love this cop's eyes. Okay, so I think, <laughs> Andrew, I think one of the things that made a bingo evening this afternoon definitely was Andrew sneezing. <laughs> well done, Andrew.
Uh, but I'm sure it also had something to do with me saying it depends. <laughs> oh, but apparently I say cheeky. You do? Yeah. Well, it's a cheeky little monkey. Okay. And a cheeky little impala. Well, apparently. you're just cheeky yourself. <laughs> <but> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's not surprising. <laughs> um, and then it's something about our hats, how we take them off when we take them off or something. I oh. saw one of them the other day. Okay. Well, we can I don't go, think go. anybody's ever seen me take my hat off. Well, well no, I did a fireside it. chat once without a hat. Never going to happen again. But, is, is, is it, by the way, any, anything around us, you've been looking with a light. But it is coming to that time of the evening. I'm starving. And as you've noticed, we made a relatively small fire this evening. And we're not cooking. Uh, partly because it's getting very dry around here. There was a little bit of a breeze when we started this afternoon. Or started the, the, the fire this evening. And I need to come down here during the day and clear up some of the, 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 the surrounding vegetation and when it was all green and there was rain we didn't have to worry too much but it is now starting to get dry and we don't want it to be a fire hazard so we brought water and things to douse the fire when we're done but I didn't want to make too big a fire that if a wind picked up that it could damage things keep us firefighting fire early hours in the morning yeah I'm hungry <laughs> hey, I want to go and eat so thanks everybody thanks for, everyone for the questions especially. Ah, it's been great and we'll see you bright and early. Cops are calling in the yeah. distance. Yes, bright and early. You're tomorrow. going to be on Wendy, I'll be on Jigger. Yep. And we'll see you 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. So thank you to Brian and Andrew behind the scenes and Alex, of course, in final control from all of us here at Wild Earth. Love you lots. Night. Bye. Bye. Oh, bye. No, we're going to the same place. I know. <laughs> <laughs> One of those... Customary thing. Oh, okay. It's been a good week. It has another one to come. More cats. More cats. More cats. More cats. More elephants. More dogs. More we dogs. need dogs. I need dogs. Cheetah. Yeah, it's coming one day. Cheetah. <laughs>